my last video, I finished my oldest historical sewing UFO. That's unfinished object, not that kind of UFO. It was my oldest because it was literally my first costume I ever tried to make. Today I am tackling my second oldest UFO, a 1908 lace dress. You might recognize this project from my DIY pattern shelf video where I rediscovered it whilst reorganizing my sewing space. And since Latino Living History has started a UFO challenge, this project seemed like a perfect fit. Real quickly, I'll go over what needs to get done. I have to make and attach a waistband, make and attach a collar, and hem the skirt. That's it. But since finishing those three really minor details would take me less time than it would to actually edit this video, I figured now would be a good opportunity to talk about UFOs. Why we have them, why we hate them, how to avoid them. Kind of like last video, this is gonna be a little bit of me summarizing my own personal lessons that I've learned from the past decade plus of sewing. But before we get into that, let's talk about this style of dress. It is sometimes called a tea gown, but that is a misnomer. This is not actually a tea gown. Tea gowns are something else entirely. During the time period of roughly 1900 to 1920s-ish, it was called a lingerie dress. But I didn't want to put that in the title of this video, lest we inadvertently attract the incels. These dresses were usually made of lightweight, fine cotton with various amounts of lace insertion and trim. They were almost always white, and despite the fact that they look super floofy and delicate, most women would have owned one, although perhaps in a style that is more practical and without this much lace. They were technically washable since they were cotton, and machine-made lace was now relatively cheap. You can find tons and tons of these dresses from the 1910s on various auction sites, and hipster brides love using them as wedding dresses. As you can imagine, a dress this complex could take a person a good amount of time to finish. But it's not just the tucks and the gathers and the buttons and the lace, all the lace, that steered this project toward the drawer of shame. Yes, this is how I store my UFOs, in plastic bags in the dresser drawers that make up my cutting table. This project was a veritable smorgasbord of problems. And I think the best way to prevent future UFOs is to analyze why our past projects became UFOs. And if you're like, uh, I haven't actually started sewing, how am I supposed to know my UFO triggers if I don't even have any yet? Well, these issues are pretty universal, so it may help just to be aware that they could happen to you. This is much more of an issue with my modern wardrobe sewing, but I often have a sudden urge to work on a new project regardless of how many other projects I haven't finished yet. While not necessarily having a clear idea going in of what I want to do, I just want to sew. Something. Anything. Right now. So I search my stash and try to match up fabrics and patterns until I find something. Usually I get through the cutting stage only to find my inspiration has vanished as quickly as it came. That is how this dress began. I had bought a bunch of batiste and lace from a local fabric shop that was closing. This is key later on because I can never get more of these supplies. Luckily, my sojo stuck around long enough to get off to a good start. I finished a bunch of big pieces of this alternating pattern of lace and tucks that I used for the sleeves and the center of the dress. But soon I hit my first stumbling block. I went into this project with a vague idea, but no real pattern or clear plan. I did eventually sketch out a plan, and I based the bodice on the gimp design in this pattern, and the skirt on this one. However, both were hacked within an inch of their tissue paper lives, and don't resemble the originals in almost any way. I know how to draft patterns, slashing and spreading skirt panels, calculating pleats, tweaking seam lines, but I did it in stages, with no mock-up, basically winging it. This was a bad, bad idea. Even with all the lace and tucks and layers, the mental work of designing the dress on the fly was more taxing than the physical work of sewing. Liz Scapism has a great video about scope creep within a project. I'll link that in the description. My scope got way out of hand, way too fast. But frankly, 
I'd been sewing for long enough by that point that I should have known better than to dive in headfirst into such an ambitious project without a lot of pre-planning. My scope creep combined with the next issue, time, just made things worse. Sometimes I do really well with deadlines. A hard external deadline, like an event, can motivate me to finish something come hell or high water. But oftentimes, if I make a self-imposed deadline, I will fail, and then the project falls by the wayside because I completely lose the motivation to finish it. Unmet deadlines can easily turn into UFOs. In this instance, I had no deadline at all. And since I was already in over my head, the mental load needed to figure out what step to work on next, like closures or sleeves, weighed so heavily on me that I didn't want to work on it at all. So I didn't. I picked this thing up a half a dozen times over the years and sewed it in sections. The problem with that came when I made a major mistake. When you don't work on something for a long time, it is easy to forget what you've already done or what you need to do next. So you may make mistakes in your order of operations. Sometimes a major mistake happens early, like accidentally cutting a pattern piece out wrong and realizing you don't have enough fabric to cut a new one. Not making a muslin beforehand is almost always a major mistake. My mistake with this dress? I had a limited length of crochet lace and I specifically planned my skirt to save just enough lace left over to make a waistband. And then sometime during or after assembling the skirt, I lost the lace. I searched for it for months. It wasn't until I moved houses and literally went through everything I owned that I gave up and accepted the fact the lace was gone for good. So now I'm admitting defeat and making a simple self-fabric waistband instead. Is it as pretty as the lace would have been? No, but I just want this dress to be done. Now at this point of the video, you may be asking yourself, why would I take advice from a lady who obviously has way too many UFOs? In my defense, I have been sewing for a very long time, and these UFOs represent a tiny fraction of the multitude of projects that I've started. And I do finish UFOs. Eventually. But the idea shouldn't be to completely avoid all UFOs. That's impossible. What you want to do is minimize the amount of UFOs you have and get back to working on them relatively quickly because the longer an unfinished project stays that way, the harder it will be to pick it back up again. So if you go into this knowing the risk that a project may turn into a UFO, there are things you can do before it becomes a UFO that will make picking it up again easier if you do have to put it away for a while. And these are also just good general practices for project management, but they're especially helpful when you break out that plastic bag after three years of dormancy. I lose pieces easily if I'm not careful. Obviously the lace. At the time, I kept all of my costume-related laces in this one zippered bag, but the lace in question didn't end up in there. I'd actually recommend keeping any notions, closures, buttons, and whatnot wherever you keep the rest of the fabric and pattern pieces for your current project. However, this only really works if you actually put the stuff in a container and don't leave it scattered all around your workspace. That is how things get lost. If I've completed sewing part of a garment, but don't need to work on it while I sew a different part, it goes in a bag. If I'm finished with a pattern piece, it goes back in the envelope, which goes in the bag. If I'm not finished with the pattern piece, it gets pinned to its coordinating fabric piece, which goes in the bag. Pattern pieces can very easily go missing. If I leave a project for more than a couple days, which is common, I'll inevitably forget important details, like how I've already shortened one sleeve, but not the other. A thing that has totally happened to me, and which I did not realize, until I'd already sewn on the cuffs. Or how I always forget what the seam allowance is supposed to be. Take notes as you go. You can use a notebook, but I like to either write directly on the pattern pieces or pin post-it notes to my fabric. This is really important for fitting changes. I have a mortal enemy. It's called the pile. Piles tend to magically appear around the room, on the end of the ironing board, the backside of the desk, the floor. They also tend to multiply like little fabric rabbits. One singular pile isn't usually a sign of danger, but when they spread to other surfaces, I realize I need to clean up. 
Since moving to this new house and also having a baby, I've been a lot better about cleaning up before, during, and after projects. I just can't afford to let stuff stack up and accidentally fall off the table so the baby can grab it and try to eat it. Because she's a baby and she tries to eat everything. Except for actual food. Cleaning and organizing is important because not only does it prevent pieces from getting lost, for me, being in a messy space really kills my sojo, which means I'm much more likely to want to quit sewing, and whatever I'm working on is way more likely to become a UFO. Are you making a mess? Yes, you are. Okay. So we've talked about UFOs that already exist and why, good practices that will help you while working on projects before they become UFOs. Now I wanna talk about the keys to preventing UFOs in the first place. Hold on, let me grab my tea. Let's talk about project planning. Don't, don't do it. I'm not saying you can't have big dream projects you want to do, or even just mental lists of things you want to make. I'm just saying, don't get too committed to it. The problem comes in when you write them down and say, I want to make the thing. Once you put a project on a physical to-do list, and it's never just one project, it's always like 12, they become real, they become binding, and you must do the thing, even if it takes you the rest of your life. And if you don't do the thing, each week, month, or year that passes will only add to the crushing weight of disappointment and self-loathing you will feel for being a lazy, uncreative failure. You won't think about all the beautiful stuff you've already made. You'll only see a list of things you've yet to sew, haunting your sewing room and your nightmares. You'll long for the things you may never make, and you certainly won't give yourself the grace to admit that you have a kid, and a job, and volunteer commitments, and a YouTube channel for some reason, and there is no physical way that you could ever crank out a robe la Française in a month. So stop torturing yourself. This suddenly got real personal. Maybe we ought to take a little bit of a break to work on hemming. To do that, I needed to put the dress on my janky dress form over a petticoat. Trying to hem this thing on a form was harder than I thought it would be. So I then decided I might be better off working with measurements and just seeing how long I needed each area of the skirt to be to clear the petticoat. I think I may have originally drafted this skirt for a one inch hem. Which means I probably don't have to level it off. Probably already good. So... I guess I'm just gonna iron the hem and sew it. The main problem I've experienced with over planning is that having too many projects on my to-do list will often tempt me to start working on something new before I've completed my current project. And it is way harder to finish one project if you are working on several other big projects all at the same time. Which is why I try my very hardest to only focus on one project at a time. Okay, now you might be asking, what if I have ADD or I get frustrated with my current project and I really just wanna work on something else? I got you. Notice how I said I only work on one project at a time? Project is a broad term that consists of multiple garments and accessories or other things. Take my 1780s ensemble, for example. At the start of that project, I needed to make stays and a false rump, and I needed new stockings, and I made a cap, and a fichu, and a pocket, and a bonnet, and I haven't even gotten to the actual dress yet. These things are all mini projects. You can have as many mini projects as you want within the overall big project. You can work on whatever you want within that one big project, just like the 1780s outfit, but not the 1780s outfit and the medieval court ensemble, and the Victorian tennis dress, and the World War I nurse's outfit, all running at the same time. That's just too much. Look, I just wanna be clear that these are things that work for me, lessons I've learned, often the hard way, but everyone is different and you really gotta figure out which strategies work best for you. That's just part of the creative journey but I'd love to know your advice for avoiding and finishing UFOs, so please share them in the comments.
quite surprised at how well this dress turned out considering how much of a fuss it was to make. Yes, the insides are quite messy, but I'm not going to focus too much on the dress's flaws. I'm just going to celebrate that it's finished. Would I have made some different construction choices if I had started this dress today rather than five years ago? Sure, but I also wouldn't choose to undertake such an intricate project today. But I do feel confident that I could take what I've learned about sewing insertion lace and making collar supports and apply it to a simpler project like an Edwardian shirtwaist. I'm wearing this dress over all the undergarments I wore with my Alice Roosevelt gown from earlier this year, plus a simple cotton corset cover. When I first started this project, I planned on making a hat to go with it, but again, I wasn't using a pattern, I got in over my head, and now that too is a UFO. So maybe after I finish my 1780s gown, I'll go work on the hat, but I'm not planning on it. I appreciate you so much for watching and subscribing and liking and following. I'll see you all in a couple weeks with another costuming project. Until then, happy sewing!